Well, howdy. 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 Who hasn't gotten to listen to a professor enough today? Well, I just need more. More professor talk. That's the great. Well, I appreciate y'all putting up with me. Um, we are going to talk about the topic of inerrancy. Um, a lot of what's going on this semester is kind of centered around, you know, even concerns with the Old Testament. So I'll use that kind of as a jumping off point. Um, I told my class today that I would be speaking tonight, and I realized this phrase, deconstructing inerrancy. I was like, if you know what either of those words mean, then this may be the talk for you. But if you don't know what either one means, then hope come anyway, you know. So we'll see. All right. Uh, so let's think about <clears throat> let's think about the Old Testament in particular, just because that's a, a hopeful place to start. Um, I want y'all before I put anything in your mind. What's something in the Old Testament that bothers you? You don't need to say it. Just kind of think it. What's something in the Old Testament that bothers you? But different people are bothered by different things in the Old Testament. Uh, one would be there's certain things that seem kind of fantastical, right? Like uh, the, some of the stories about, about Jonah and the whale, things like that. Other parts of the Old Testament seem kind of brutal. Right? They seem like, you know, uh, the conquest of, of Canaan and people killing each other seemingly at God's behest. Um, other parts seem unjust. If you read through the Levitical law, there's a lot of, you know, corporate punishment or corporal punishment, meaning like multiple people being punished for the same thing. Um, there's un other things that you might think like, has that really happened? How many people came out of Egypt? So just on the fantastical side, you can think of, of the story of Jonah. Uh, <clears throat> anybody? So this is from Jericho, right? This is a very, this is a, a, an animated movie they made, very historically accurate about the fall of Jericho um, and the conquest that happened there. And then um, I think Zach had even taught in the past about like just how many people were involved in the Exodus. Like you start counting up the numbers and you're like, this is a lot of people. Is that really historically the way it went? So these are the sort of things that kind of bother people about the Old Testament. I'm not going to be able to get into the weeds on any of these. I more so want to talk today about what's the methodology we use when there's something in the Bible that bothers you, right? You could, you could be bothered by any one of these kind of things, especially in the Old Testament. So I want you to kind of think through what, what, our, what our goals are and how we can do that. Um, so I'll go ahead and give you like the, the, the goal before I actually get going because you, you might uh, lose your attention span. Um, so we want to read the Old Testament with the original author and audience in mind, which is hard because they live in a different place and spoke a different language than we do, okay? Live in a different time as well. And ultimately, as believers, as Christians, Jesus is the center of our faith. And that means when we think about reading the Bible, we want to understand God's Word. We want to understand something like the Old Testament the way that Jesus did, meaning that it is authoritative. That's an important word we'll get into a lot today. And that it's not just a collection of stories. It's not merely a manual, but it's something that points to Jesus. And so a lot of the things that bother us, if we can can, can bring these pieces in, I think it'll be helpful. Um, one, of the, one of the really beautiful uh, passages in the New Testament talking about the Old Testament, this um, passage from Luke 24 is Jesus is on the walk to Emmaus. This is after his resurrection. He's with a couple of disciples who don't realize that it's him. And they're like, yeah, this, the last few days have been crazy. I don't understand. And Jesus says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So this is effectively the greatest Old Testament lesson that's ever happened, right? Where Jesus actually explains to two of his disciples, here's how everything in the Old Testament points to this. Um, if you were to be a fly on the wall for something in, in the Bible, this would probably be a pretty good choice. Okay, um, throughout the day, I'm going to use this little icon. Uh, does anybody know who this is? Who is yeah, what's his name? It's Bender. Okay, I'm too old. Apparently, y'all are too young for Futurama even. If you see Bender, just kind of bookmark like, ah, this might be a good point in the Q&A to come back to. So I'll let Bender pop up there, here and there. Yes, sir? Perhaps I should say this for the Q&A, but why is Bender an emblem of Q&A? Uh, I don't know. I used him once and people liked it, and therefore I'm going to stick with it. Bender makes me laugh is the short answer. So, yeah. All right. So if you think about something, whatever it was that you came up with earlier, X in the Old Testament bothers me. So what do I do? What do I do with X? You kind of only have three options. Um, you could think like the Bible is wrong. The Bible is wrong to affirm whatever X is. That's option number one. Uh, you might think like, does the Bible really affirm X? Maybe I'm like not understanding correctly. Maybe I'm not interpreting the Bible correctly. Maybe I should kind of go back to the text again and figure out if the Bible really is affirming X. And then this last option is like, okay, maybe the Bible really is affirming X and I just have to live with it. These are the three options, right? Anytime somebody tells you something and you're like, oh, I don't know, either you think they're wrong, you think, did they really affirm that? Or maybe they're right and you have to live with it. 
Um, the key consideration that people ha are worried about, they're worried about this first one. Christians have long worried about this first one because if you can merely say the Bible is wrong on any given topic where you and the Bible disagree, then you can effectively filter out the Bible's teachings to suit yourself. Um, whereas uh, traditionally Christians have considered the Bible a source of authority. And if you think of what, what an authority is, an authority is someone who tells you what to do. But in this case, is not merely someone who's telling you what to do, but what to believe and how to think. So the, the key issue is the Bible's authority. And if you give yourself this option of saying like, yeah, the Bible's wrong about that, then you've effectively uh, uh, given yourself an escape route anytime that you come up against the Bible's authority. An authority that is only authoritative when you agree with it is not much of an authority, right? So um, Augustine uh, famously said, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. Uh, which is a, a, a much better way of phrasing that same point. Um, this kind of thing doesn't apply to any other, other authority figure, right? If you, had a co if you have a coach and you're like, I do whatever the coach tells me, as long as I agree with what the coach says, then that's not really your coach. He's not really an authority figure over you, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to distinguish as we go through tonight what I would consider to be a helpful view of the concept of inerrancy. Y'all, that's a very North American word. We're going to talk about what that means. And then later I'll talk so about some very unhelpful views of inerrancy that you're very likely to encounter in uh, evangelical context here in the U.S. So here's the basic idea, and I think this is fairly helpful. Uh, Wayne Grudem defines inerrancy as the idea that Scripture in the original manuscripts, properly interpreted, does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So the key word there, of course, is properly interpreted, which shows there's that possibility that if you find something that's that's a little strange in Scripture. You do have to double-check, like, am I really understanding it correctly? The other thing to note here is this idea that in the original manuscripts, there are textual variants. There are old manuscripts of, of the Bible that slightly differ from each other. And so we would say, like, well, if, so, if some copyist made a mistake, that's not covered under this. It's only the original manuscripts, so to speak, that, are, that have this label of authority and inerrancy on them, right? And if you want to say, what, what is inerrancy in a single sentence? It's this. The Bible doesn't say oops. We'll talk about this more as we go because you have to say, like, the Bible doesn't say oops. Does that mean, who, who's not saying oops? But this is my main idea in a sentence. Is when we look to the Bible, the Bible doesn't say oops. Because if you allow for the possibility of oops, again, that means that this is not really an authoritative source. Um, the Bible consistently refers to the idea that the Word of God is authoritative in these kind of ways. Um, in the Psalms, it says, The promises of the Lord are promises that are pure, silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. In the Proverbs, it says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. So there is this consistent concept throughout Scripture that if something is God's Word, you really can take it to the bank and there are going to be no oops to be found. Okay, uh, this is one to come back to, especially this idea of, of, of whether there are these kind of mistakes. Part of the reason that I think that we should adhere to this view is because it certainly seems to be the view of the historical Jesus, right? Jesus says, um, he's answering the, the Pharisees, he tells them, you're wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. The idea is, if you know the scriptures and the power of God, then you're going to have things right. In John 10, the Jews answered Jesus, it is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answers them, it is, not writ is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God, God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I'm the Son of God. Notice that as Jesus is dialoguing back and forth with uh, these other people, that he just assumes, he just assumes that scripture cannot be broken, and they assume the same thing. That's a part of his argumentation. So I think these two passages in particular give us a really clear view of what Jesus' view of what the written scriptures, the Word of God, what, the, what kind of properties that it actually has. Okay? Um, <clears throat> this is the classic uh, uh, verse from 2 Timothy 3 about um, how Christians have historically understood scripture. We use this phrase, all scripture is breathed out. Some, 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 in, in, uh, in, some translations will say inspired. In some sense, the actual, a better word would not be inspired, but expired, breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So this is a very high view of Scripture. And if this is what Jesus wants to commend to us, that's what we should hold to. So let's see, let's see if we can understand how that actually works in practice, though. So one reason it's confusing is because if you say, who wrote the Bible? We go to some child Sunday school class and say, who wrote the Bible? They, I mean, the kids, are, they, they know, they're like, 
God, Jesus. Like those are always the answer. And so you would say the Bible is God's word. So there is this idea of a divine author, but much more immediately. I mean, it's in the titles of the book. First John, first Peter, right? These letters of Paul that there is a human author. And so the way that these two relate to each other is not trivial, right? It's not easy to understand how exactly this works. Scripture does briefly speak to this idea. Uh, 1 Peter, it says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things this shows you is this idea of inspiration. A person is writing something down, but yet it's considered to be the Word of God. Is, um, shows that it is the Holy Spirit working through a person that actually makes this happen. Uh, Michael Bird, whose work uh, provided a lot of the inspiration for tonight's talk, um, he says, this actually shows you that your doctrine of Scripture, your doctrine of the Bible, is effectively a subset of your doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The idea that the Holy Spirit works through people, and in this case, actually works to inspire um, something that is authoritative. So this idea, is, the Bible doesn't have some magical authority on its own. It's not a magic book. It, it has these kind of properties because um, uh, because of this concept of being inspired, and it almost kind of belongs under the authority of the Holy Spirit. This is important because a lot of people will kind of put the Bible in its own little category as if it has the, these, these magical properties, when in reality, the properties that the Bibles have ultimately stem from the idea that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> now, how many of you are familiar with this little button on your phone? Yes, you hit that button, and then you speak to your phone, and then you realize your phone is not quite in tune with your particular accent. <laughs> I'm a Texan, which means no matter how much I try, the phone is always like, what? Anybody, the phone, it always gets it wrong. It's very disappointing. And so um, you might be tempted to think that uh, uh, inspiration works in the same way where God speaks and the human is dictating whatever God says. If that's true, the human can basically turn their brain off, like, whatever you say, I shall write. Um, but it doesn't seem to actually work that way. We don't believe in, in any kind of dictation theory. You can actually see that each of the human authors write in their own voice and their own style. So it's not dictation in the same way. But the idea would be that, God, that people are writing what God intended them to write and that God preserves that from error. So that's the concept behind inspiration in the context of inerrancy. Um, and this is important because if the human is not a mere automaton, then that means the author's intent actually matters. What that author was thinking about when they wrote it down actually matters when you try to interpret the scriptures. It's not that they were a robot that was just dictating whatever God said. Okay, uh, so one of, some of you may be thinking like, but there's some weird stuff in the Bible. So I want you all to start thinking about some of the things that may have bothered you when I started this talk. I said, what is the thing, we'll take the Old Testament for example, that bothers you? Um, <clears throat> I know there are a few people in the room who uh, are in the science, engineering, mathematics kind of world, and uh, you may realize like there's some weird math in the Bible. Like there, there's actually a point at one point where, if you look at the circumference and diameter of one of the things in the Pentateuch, it's like oh, it seems to be implying that pi is three, and then you say pi is not three. Pi is three point one four one five nine blah, 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 right, and so even if we said like. Basically, what we would say is because this is not dictated, it's written by human authors, then ordinary language, ordinary ways of speaking do apply to the Bible. And um, you wouldn't jump some, down someone's throat for rounding numbers, for loose quotations, meaning this person said that. This, is that exactly what they said? Did you, did, you take a, did, you, did you record them and say word for word what they said? No, you wouldn't jump down your friend's throat over that. And so we don't want to do the same thing to the Bible. And then this last one is unusual or uncommon grammatical reconstruction or gr grammatical constructions. Um, as many of you know, I am originally from West Texas, way, way, way up in the Panhandle. And uh, if you move, if you drive from here west and north, like toward that part of Texas, at some point you stop seeing any trees and you start seeing windmills, and that's when you know you have entered West Texas. And it's a, it's 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 big, and you start to hear phrases like, uh, "There's Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones is from Midland." Um, the only correct West Texas accent I've ever heard in any movie is in No Country for Old Men, where Tommy Lee Jones plays a sheriff. I was like, wow, he sounds, he sounds dead on like what I grew up with. And it's because he really is from West Texas. And they'll say things like, that don't make no sense. Now, technically, an English major would say, um, that don't make no sense is a double negative. That's not the correct way to do it. That's kind of a redneck accent. But we would say, like, calm down, English major. It's, it's okay for him to talk like that. And there's the equivalent of... This West Texas redneck talk 
in Hebrew, in the Bible, right? And that's okay because that's how people talk. That's the author's voice. So unusual grammatical constructions where the subject and verb don't totally agree, things like that are okay because that's how people speak. Um, and the other problem we have to worry about is, is uh, we may be tempted to say, well, what counts as accurate? What counts as a mistake? And we have our own standards for what we impose on the Bible. That's a real problem because we're effectively imposing our own rules on a culture where it doesn't work. Um, my parents used to live in Australia. I have had the opportunity to drive in Australia. And you can imagine how embarrassing it would be if I went and complained to all the Australians like, Every, all of you are doing it wrong. You're driving on the wrong side of the road. What is your problem? If you're in Australia, you have to drive as the Australians do. And it does take some getting used to. So when you go to the Bible, it is a much bigger leap than going to Australia. You are leaving your own time, your own culture, your own language. You are going to that other culture, which means you have to adapt to their way of doing things. Um, no one likes that American who goes to Australia and complains about the way people talk or the way people drive, right? What was the other, the other experience I had in Australia is um, I sat down on a plane and this boisterous Australian sat down next to me and he said, he said, how are you going? And I said, where am I going or how am I doing? I wonder which one he means. And I, I paused long enough for him to be like, you speak English? And I was like, yes. And so anyway, there you go. So when you're in, when you're in another country, that's what you're going to deal with. And w when you enter the world of the Bible, you are entering that other culture with their own expectations, including of things like accuracy and quotations and things of that nature. <clears throat> um, so one really great quote I know our lives change not with like big long talks, but with individual quotes. This quote has really changed the way I look at the Bible. This is from John Walton. He was talking about Genesis, but I think it applies across the board. He says, the Bible is not written for us. So the Bible is written for us. Your Bible is for you, but it's not written to you. Like when you read, you know, 1 Corinthians or something like that, you are kind of listening in on a phone conversation between two parties who lived a long time ago, and you have to do the extra work to figure out like, okay, what's their context and what are they talking to each other about? Because it was not, that, that letter was not originally written to you, but it is written for you to benefit from. I think this is a really good way of looking at Scripture. Um, so here's some examples of us perhaps uh, getting on the Bible's case unnecessarily. Jesus tells this, uh, this parable and includes this, this little uh, 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 tidbit about how the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And when you have a mustard seed, it then can turn into this very large tree. So at this point, a, a scientifically minded 21st century American could say like, well, actually, the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. So this is not an accurate or true statement in the Bible. Now, here's the question. If you then go to Matthew and say, Matthew, you wrote down that Jesus said that the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds. Is Matthew's response to you going to be, oops? Probably not. Probably not. He's going to say like, I think you're missing the point. This is not a botany lesson. Take it down a notch. Why do you try to understand what I'm trying to get at? Get at? The point is not which seed is the smallest. Are you with me? I'll do another example. Do y'all know where I'm about to go with this? <laughs> I know. Sam, I think you mentioned something about this, right? You had a, you had a friend who was really bothered because <clears throat> in the Levitical law, there's all this stuff about clean and unclean animals and, you know, pigs are bad and cows are maybe okay. Um, and it actually talks about how rabbits are not okay. Rabbits are unclean. It says the hair, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And of course, rabbits don't actually chew the cud. And this is where you say like, maybe if you actually interpret the Hebrew, it means that like rabbits are gross. They like eat their own poop. They do all kinds of things, right? So they're kind of regurgitating or re-eating. So close, right? And if you try to figure out what was the Hebrew actually get, saying. So this, this is the same kind of a problem is that we're, we're, we're applying that, well, actually, scientific kind of language to the Bible. And, and you can tell that's not really attributing a mistake to the Bible. Okay, here's a joke. How did the mansplainer get injured? They said he fell down a manhole, but it was a well, actually. <laughs> okay, we'll keep going. Uh, similar kinds of problems you even see in the New Testament. Uh, if you think about the four Gospels, and whether they tell the same story, um, they often do tell the same story, but they'll like, get little details slightly different from each other, or they'll, they'll tell things out of order. For instance, in the story of the temptation, in Matthew, it goes stones, turn these, these stones into bread, uh, temple, worship, right? He says, turn these stones into bread, throw yourself off the temple, worship me. But in Luke, it goes stones, worship, temple. It's not exactly the same order. So what's the deal? 
Similarly, if you think about when Jesus cleansed the temple in, uh, in Luke, it happens pretty late in the gospel, like closer to, to the time of Jesus' death. But in John, it happens in like John chapter 2. So the question is like, well, when did it happen? So this is where questions of interpretation and intent uh, start to come into play. Because if you say like, Luke, John, like you two are not on the same page, what's the deal? What Luke would actually say to you, if he were being patient, which I bet he would, he would say, listen, what genre am I? I'm an ancient biography. We don't necessarily tell things in exactly the order that it happened. That was not my intent. And if you took it that way, if you took it as like, it happened in exactly this chronological order with a video camera, then you've misunderstood me. You've misunderstood my intent. An ancient biography will sometimes group group uh, events together in a slightly different way to get a, a different point across. The intent is not necessarily to communicate this precise chronology. And that's okay. Calm down. So that's frequently the response. Instead of us coming to the biblical authors and saying, ah, 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 you made a mistake, they're not going to say oops. They're going to say, like, calm down. Make sure you understand what I'm trying to communicate. Make sure you really understand, like, what the genre of what I've written is. Does this make sense? So I think this is a helpful way to approach inerrancy. Um, okay, who is this? Who is this person? Michelle Obama. Yeah, I know it looks like Kerry Washington. Um, there are a lot of people who had an issue with this portrait when it was taken, or when, when it was taken, when it was painted. And people said like, mm, it's not as detailed. I can't exactly for sure tell that it's her. It seems like the artist cares a lot more about her dress than about her. But, but uh, the former first lady actually liked it a lot. And it's this idea that this is not intended to be like, click, I've taken a picture of you. This is exactly you. But rather it's a portrait not a photo, it's a portrait trying to, to accentuate certain ideas about the former first lady that, that uh, you might not even get from just a mere photograph. And so many, if we think about genre, many of the parts of the Bible are much more portrait than they are photo. And if that bothers you, it has to be a photo because the Bible has to fit this genre that I have my expectations for, you know, like the news has to get the quote exactly right. That's you imposing your 21st century expectations on an ancient text. You have to be okay with the idea that they didn't have the same expectations that you did. They're not necessarily writing in exactly the genre you might want them to. We have to be okay with that. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is how, that's, so I'll conclude that part. That's what I would consider a helpful way to think of inerrancy. That the Bible doesn't make mistakes. And many of the times when we say like, mm, these two accounts conflict or rabbits don't do that, most of our complaints fall into the well actually kind of a category and don't really end up attributing a true mistake or a true oops to the Bible. However, many of you have probably seen the concept of inerrancy, the concept of biblical authority abused, especially here in the North American context. So now I'll talk about unhelpful inerrancy, unhelpful inerrancy. Uh, here's a big part of it. So mistake number one is that like, I'm obviously interpreting it correctly. Don't tell me I'm not. So earlier we were looking to avoid this part that the Bible is wrong. But then some people are really not okay with this possibility of considering that they might have in interpreted the Bible incorrectly. Uh, on Twitter recently, I saw a really good encapsulation of this concept. Now you see your interpretation of Scripture can't possibly be the right one because Scripture interprets itself in my brain correctly, automatically, and that's not what I came up with, right? She was writing this in jest. But I was like, I definitely heard, I heard some of that in my church growing up. Some of you may have too. This is this expectation that like scripture, all of scripture must be so clear that you should be able to interpret it, no problem, with no background, no work, and that's going to be right. And that's a pretty rough expectation. Okay, let's keep it going. Um, the other kind of problem you might see, this is Dr. Mike Lycona. He's actually going to be here in two weeks. Um, so if you think interpretation is a problem, then if someone does interpret it differently than you, if they interpret the text different from you, you might be prone to say like, oh, you know my interpretation is right, so you disagreeing with my interpretation is actually you disagreeing with the Bible, which means you think the Bible has mistakes in it. Right? This is what happened to Dr. Lycona a few years ago. There was a well-publicized incident where uh, Dr. Lycona looked at this passage in Matthew 27. This is in the context of the crucifixion. Um, when Jesus dies, it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Uh, and then the, a very strange verse, The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, Lycona basically taught, he said, like, I don't know if this is exactly how it went down if you had a video camera. I think there may be some apocalyptic kind of language here to indicate the, the importance of what was happening. 
but, but I don't think this is meant to, to be taken exactly literally. And other people lost their mind about that. Now, it is fine. It is totally fine if you want to disagree with his interpretation. That's fine. But what happened to him was everyone said, you are denying inerrancy. You disagree with my interpretation of this passage, which is obviously right. And the only reason you would do that is because you think the Bible has a mistake in it. So ultimately, he was, you know, he had a bunch of speaking events canceled, a number of different things. You should ask him about it when he comes in a couple of weeks. This is one of the most high profile cases I can think of, of someone uh, getting, I hate to use this word, someone getting canceled over. And anyone associated with him or who had, come, had him come speak. Yeah. Uh, so it was, yes, <laughs> correct. Um, so you can see how how messy something like this can get once you start saying my interpretation has to be correct and there is no possibility of someone disagreeing with me in good faith how quickly that can that can devolve out of control it also means that this concept of inerrancy becomes like this uh, um, Sam we were the other day we were talking about the idea of a shibboleth how many of y'all heard of the word shibboleth computer science people actually use this word sometimes and it basically means like a secret password and it comes from a story in the Bible in the Old Testament where uh, uh, the Israelites would make people say the word shibboleth. And if you couldn't say it properly, it means you weren't from there and they would kill you because you're clearly a spy. I think maybe the Texas equivalent I can give is, um, let's try this. The stars at night are big and bright. Clap, 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 clap. Oh, did anybody do an extra clap? If you did an extra clap, then I know you're not from here. Right? So that would be a shibboleth. Right? If we have... So, I, Julie, I know you're not actually a New Jersey person, but if a New Jersey person snuck in here, they would be like, oh, like they would, they, would, they would have messed it up. So you can use that song as a shibboleth to see who's a true Texan. So people were trying to use this con con concept of inerrancy, not as a, a guardrail on under, how we understand scripture, but as a way more so, so to figure out who's in and who's not in the club. And they used this whole incident to effectively to throw Lycona out of the club. Does that make sense? No, I should ask him about it when he comes. Um, I think this is maybe uh, the best way I can illustrate this. I've shared this illustration before. Let's, use a, let's not use Genesis or anything like that. Let's use the story of Jonah. I want you to kind of figure out who you are. I have person A, B, C here. You ready for this? The dynamic I'm about to describe to you has repeated itself thousands of times in the North American Christian context in the last few years. Okay, so person A believes the book of Jonah is intended to be um, an accurate record of history, whale and all, and I believe it. Okay? That's what person A thinks. Jonah is historical. Jonah's listed. He's, has a, he, has a, he has a father. And this is something that actually happened. Someone really did go through all this stuff. Person B says, like, I don't think that's how we're supposed to take the book of Jonah. I think the author of the book of Jonah did not intend it to be taken literally. It's a word picture of Israel's lack of mercy toward these other nations like Assyria even as, as God has shown those other nations mercy. And Israel is guilty of some of the same things as those other nations. So if you think about how the book of Jonah ends, it doesn't have an ending. It's God pleading with Jonah and said, you, don't, you care more for this vine than you do for this city full of people and cows. That's actually the last word of the book of Jonah is cows. <laughs> this city has many people and cows. And that's how it ends. And the idea is to then look and say to the, uh, the Israelite who reads the book of Jonah, like, maybe you fall into this too, that, you want mercy for yourself, but you're unwilling to show mercy to these other nations. <clears throat> and that's what the author intended. That's what person B thinks. Person C says, well, now we know that it's physically impossible to survive being adjusted by a whale, but ancient people didn't know that, so they thought it was possible. We now know that's physically impossible. So instead of insisting on this ancient story actually being true, let's look for its broader message and significance in our lives. Okay, here's the questions. Does person A believe in inerrancy? Yes. Looks like it. Person C, maybe not. Seems like they think that the author of Jonah thought it was possible to survive being ingested by a whale, but now we know that's not true. So maybe person C doesn't believe in inerrancy, right? What about person B? We say yes. How can you tell that person B is true to the authority of the Bible on this point? Yeah, they're looking for context. They're looking for what the author wanted to communicate. They're saying, what does the author want to communicate? Whatever that is, that's what I want to believe. Our definition of inerrancy involves being properly interpreted. Right. So if you have to properly interpret the passage, and a literal right. reading might not be the proper interpretation in every case. 
Right, person B is very concerned to get the passage interpreted properly. Can y'all tell what's coming? Here is the dynamic that is at work probably in churches that you have been to. Person A and person B should, should be able to have a civil dialogue about the correct way to interpret Jonah. Right? They should be able to, to do that. That should be possible. However, person A is a little paranoid that person B is actually person C in disguise. They think like, well, yeah, you say you have this alternate interpretation, but like you really just don't believe that miracles are possible. And you really believe that the book of Jonah is just a mistake and you're looking for some moralistic interpretation alternative. And plus, my, inter my interpretation is obviously right. So the only possible way reason you have for disagreeing with me is that you're actually person C and you think miracles are impossible. Here is the truly messed up part. There are historical incidents where person A's paranoia that person B is actually person C in disguise. There are historical cases in the last 40 years here in the U.S. where that suspicion has been correct. Where this person giving this kind of uh, interpretation really didn't believe in the authority of Scripture and kind of covered it up with these alternate explanations. And if you can't have a discussion in good faith, then it's pretty hard to have a discussion. That means that person A, instead of listening to this person's interpretation, they are suspicious and think like, hmm, I bet you're secretly one of those people who doesn't believe in the authority of Scripture. Which is why, I mean, here's the sad truth. In the church I grew up in, if you have person B's interpretation of Jonah, you probably can't be hired as pastor. Isn't that silly? But the reason is people are using it as a marker. Like, mm, you might be person C, and I can't have a person C who doesn't believe in the authority of Scripture leading the church, and the risks are too high. This dynamic is all over the place in seminaries and churches across the continent. Does my little picture make sense? You can probably associate some of these people with names you can think of. Uh, the last part that's a little goofy is when people use inerrancy as a creed. So, for instance, if you want to be a part of the Evangelical Philosophical Society, here's all you got to believe. The Bible alone, and the Bible in its entirety, is the Word of God written and therefore inerrant in the original manuscripts. Oh yeah, and God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each an uncreated person, one in essence, equal in power and glory. The end. The end. Anything missing? Yep, yep. There's a whole lot of... So even evangelical, so you need some evangel in your... You should probably have some evangel in your, in your creed. So why would they do this? The assumption is... If you believe in inerrancy, all the important stuff will flow naturally from that. But that's, asking, that's really asking for trouble. There are a lot of there are, you know, people from the Holy Church of QAnon might sign on to this, and Lord knows what weird things they believe. So this, is very, this shows that people are tempted to use inerrancy as the only creed instead of using the actual Apostles' Creed to, to be a marker. So people can disagree on interpretation, but the inerrancy issue is not the really thing, the thing that marks someone off as an orthodox. If someone says, I believe in inerrancy, and I, I, and, but I believe that Jesus was a created being, you wouldn't accuse them of disbelieving inerrancy. You would say, like, your interpretation of Scripture is off. I'm a really key point. Sorry. And that's how you would assess that. Does that make, are you all with me? So this idea of confusing inerrancy and creeds is, is, is a bit of a mess. The other problem with this is this whole concept of inerrancy, um, go talk to your brothers and sisters in Christ in Ethiopia and see what they, if they know what you're talking about. They'd be like, what? I, I don't know what that is. They know what the creeds are, though. You go to China. You go around the world. This particular fight is pretty unique to the American and Canadian context. So it seems a little weird to make this the be-all and end-all um, when half the world hasn't even heard of this concept or this particular fight. Okay, I'll keep going here. So those are our problems. So uh, let's go back around and ask about how do we deal with those passages in the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want to get into all the details, but uh, I think some at least helpful ways you can think about some, whatever that problem passage was that you ta taught earlier. Um, sometimes there are passages in the Old Testament that are pretty brutal, but it's not necessarily saying this is what you should do. Maybe one of the best examples I've heard of that. Have anybody seen protesters wearing the little handmade tail? Costumes? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, I've not seen the show, but I have read the book of The Handmaid's Tale, and the idea is that, like, oh, the Bible says that, like, you know, you have your wife, and then you have their handmaiden, and you try to impregnate them, blah, blah, blah. 
Just because someone like Jacob took multiple wives in the Bible does not necessarily mean the Bible's like, thumbs up to that, that's what everybody should do. We would say it is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Just because the Bible shows someone doing something doesn't mean that is prescribed as something you ought to do. That's all over the Old Testament. Um, am I understanding the genre correctly? We talked about this um, you know, in regard to the Gospels, in regard to Genesis, things like that. Um, so effectively, this is what persons A, B, C were arguing about with Jonah, is what's the genre? Are we understanding the genre of the book correctly? Because that's going to affect how you interpret it. Um, am I unnecessarily allergic to miracles? This is a very common thing uh, if you live in the scientific age post-enlightenment. Because of the Enlightenment, we've all kind of gotten into this mode of saying like, well, the, 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 the natural world runs on its own and God like started it spinning and then God stays away and doesn't like stick his finger in there and don't tell me there are any miracles because that upsets the, the whole mechanistic clock. That's an Enlightenment idea that, we, that, that, that there's no reason to impose that on the Bible. There's no reason to be unnecessarily allergic to miracles because if there's a God, he really can reach into the world and change things here and there. And the reality is God is not some distant God who occasionally reaches in and messes with the system and does a miracle. God is ultimately invo intimately involved with every aspect of creation. He holds every atom and makes every little electron fly. So this idea of like miracles as a violation of the laws of nature, that's for a, a talk for a different day. But you could see person C was thinking like, oh, Moses parting the Red Sea, Jonah surviving being eaten by a whale, like that doesn't really make sense scientifically without thinking about the fact that there is a God involved who actually has purposes and can change things. This is a common problem. Am I okay with the idea of God judging a nation? For individualistic Americans, we kind of don't like this idea. We say, God can judge me for what I have done, but don't judge my nation for what we have done. I didn't vote for that. And, but there's a lot of this in the Old Testament, right? The idea of a city or a nation being destroyed or being conquered over their corporate sin. It's pretty foreign to us as Americans, but this is all over the Old Testament. Um, and then this is what I was bringing up earlier. What would the human author say if I could speak to them? I, th I, feel, I feel like once you bring these kind of questions up, you'd say, I'd like to speak to the author of Leviticus about the eating habits of rabbits, please. They're not, you know they're not going to say oops. They're going to be like, oh, <laughs> well, just track with me here, buddy. So. And then finally, there are some passages that maybe you're supposed to be bothered by. This is a hard one that maybe you're supposed to be bothered by certain passages. I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll end with this. There's a, uh, a final passage. Um, look at this passage. This is one of the most bothersome ones to me in all the Old Testament. This is from the Psalms. It's, and it ends, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall, be, sh blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. That is pretty brutal. Then you think, like, is this how I should be feel about my enemies? That I wish someone would kill their babies and throw their babies against the rocks? Who's someone else in the Old Testament who felt like this nation that oppressed Israel, like they should be completely destroyed? Jonah. We heard about him just moments ago. Jonah says stuff like this. Jonah has a point, but Jonah doesn't quite see the whole picture. The other thing you can think about here is, are there any other stories in the Old Testament that mention the killing of children? Any come to, come to your mind? First Samuel chapter 15, when I guess Saul destroys, I think it was Amalek, and mm -hmm. he has to kill every man, woman, and child and infant. Yeah. And he kills everyone except for the king. Mm -hmm. These killings of nations? How about one more famous than that? Egyptian first Yeah. Well, first the Egyptians kill the Hebrews by th throwing the Hebrew babies into the Nile. And then later the 10th plague is the Egyptian firstborns killed. Why, why during the 10th plague are the Hebrew firstborns not killed? Yeah, they put the Passover lamb blood on their doorpost. What about Abraham and Isaac? That I, Abraham was supposed to kill his own son. And ultimately Isaac doesn't have to die and a ram is put in Isaac's place. This idea, that, this idea that goes throughout the Old Testament, you start thinking about children having to die, or someone, someone's children having to die and perhaps being saved out of that, and that mercy from God that, that those children are saved, um, consistently points ahead to this idea of someone else taking their place. 
So when you read passages like this, you can't read it on its own and say, am I supposed to feel like that? You have to think, what's the big picture of Scripture and how does this point ahead to Jesus? There's a famous story of uh, Martin and his wife, Katie Luther. And Katie Luther really hated that story of Abraham and Isaac. She was like, why would God, why would God tell a father to treat his son like that? And of course, the answer is Martin told Katie, he's like, God had to treat his own son like that. God really did offer his own son. And the story of Abraham and Isaac is supposed to point you to Christ. And so is this. So that big picture of, am I seeing the big picture of Scripture? Not this one little passage, but overall, how does it point to Jesus? This helps a lot, especially on these kind of brutal kind of stories like that one. Okay. Uh, Andrew hopefully added this slide that there's actually a whole bunch of stuff on the RC uh, Texas A&M YouTube channel uh, confronting Old Testament controversy that have come up over the last few years, including, you know, very big questions like were Adam and Eve real? What about the Exodus? Was it actually historical? Things like this. Okay. Um, and the final one I guess I'll, I'll point to you is a lot of people, especially uh, college students, they really don't like this last one. I don't like the idea of something that bothers me and I just have to live with it. I don't like that. But the truth is, like, there really is stuff in the Bible that you're not necessarily going to be able to nail down. So instead of saying, the Bible is wrong, or maybe I misinterpret it, you may have to live with it and say, like, I don't understand this, but God's proven himself trustworthy. So on those weird passages that I don't get, I'm just going to trust God. And you trusting God, saying God is trustworthy, I trust him even when I don't quite get it, is not irrational. That's what we always do. We trust people who have tr proven themselves trustworthy, and that honors God. So that's where I guess I'll leave you, is that we really have to be okay with this point. Uh, on that note, I think I've gone too long, so I will stop and take questions. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bender-style questions. Ready? Uh, Jackson, I saw you first. So with cultural context and stuff, how do you know how far to take that? Mm. Because I've had conversations... Um, like, in terms of, like, the issue of, like, homosexuality, where mm -hmm. it was, like, well, they couldn't get married under the Jewish system of authority, and so, like, now under America, like, you can have, like, a gay marriage, and mm -hmm. that's totally illegal. And so you're submitting to the authority placed above you, and then you're having sex within the confines of marriage. And so, therefore, can that be God-glorifying? Um, because a lot of the, especially the New Testament passages, are just talking about, like, sodomy. Right. Know, like, specifically. Right. Um, and so, like, what? How do you contextualize? Like, where do you know where to draw the line? Yeah, because there there is a real danger of, of it, once you say like, well, you have to consider the context. You could end up making everything the Bible says only local to that context, such that it has no relevance to you. Um, in the in the case of you know sexual sin, like what you like what you talked about, um, I think you, you this is more of a hermeneutical question than an, an inerrancy question. And so people would have to argue like, what is the proper way to interpret Scripture? Is this something that really is local, local and cultural, or is this grounded in the nature of humanity that extends from 2,000 years ago even to today in the way that God made us? Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is when you have that discussion, that's kind of outside the inerrancy question. It's a hermeneutical question. What's the right way to interpret it? I think part of what you're getting at, though, is you're seeing that people have a temptation. Let's to go back to my little list here. Um, people sometimes they say, like, well, I don't want to say the Bible's wrong. But I really don't want to live with the homosexuality teaching. So a lot of what motivates person A is they know that we are all tempted to like, can I fish around and maybe find an interpretation that will relieve the pressure on me and maybe make the Bible more palatable to the culture around me? So I guess that warning is legitimate, right? You'd have to say like, look, if you're reinterpreting the Bible to try to get it to where it doesn't affirm X, what are your reasons? Are you really trying to understand the scriptures or are you trying to make your faith more acceptable and easier to get along with people around you. Because getting along with people around you is not a good reason to reinterpret the Bible. Does that make sense? And in that case in particular, um, I think you have to recognize, like, I may, have some, I may have some ulterior motives for trying to reinterpret the Bible in this way to, to get along with the culture around me. Um, maybe the easiest way to, do, to get at those kind of questions and figure out, like, am I letting my culture influence the way I interpret the Bible? is to start talking to Christians who aren't in your culture. How do Christians 400 years ago think about that question? How do Christians in China think about that question? How do Christians in Africa think about that question? So if you get outside your own context and say, African Christians, what do you think? Chinese Christians, what do you think? Indonesian Christians, what do you think? 
They're not facing the same cultural pressures as you, but they do have the same Bible you do. So you can glean a lot of wisdom from there. Ben. I'm curious what you think about, um, so there's inerrancy, and then one thing you didn't mention was infallibility. There's two <laughs> um, distinct ideas where the way I understand it is somebody who um, thinks that it's, that scripture is infallible, but not necessarily inerrant, um, could, um, could say something that's scientifically wrong, even if everything it says is morally correct. So yeah, I, I actually deleted a slide about that. And the reason is, um, so in the debate over the last you know, 30, 40 years, it has been very common for people to use these two words, inerrant and infallible. The only thing I don't like about those words is if you just look up the definition, they really do mean the same thing. But the coded definition that people use is if someone says the Bible is infallible but not inerrant, usually what that means is the Bible is correct when it speaks to questions of faith, but it's not necessarily correct when it comes to matters of science and history. Um, I don't understand how people can make that distinction. I think a better way to approach what is the Bible saying about science is this question of like interpreting it correctly in the author's intent. It's not that the Bible in this passage is right about faith and wrong about science. It's that the interpretation, the author's intent of what they were trying to get across was not about science. So it's not that the science is wrong here. It's that it's not about science. Does that make sense? Um, it, it's especially concerning to me to once you start admitting like the possibility of like oh maybe the bible's wrong in the history there's all sorts of stuff that can potentially start going out out the window christianity is not a not a faith that's like here's a bunch of good ideas here's a bunch of concepts but it really does ground itself in actual historical events paul says if christ is not raised that's a historical event then we are of all men most to be pitied so so um i, I would shy away from the infallible versus inerrant distinct one and go maybe exp explain the sciencey stuff more like this and that includes Genesis, too. Uh, go ahead, sir. Um, so how do we determine what constitutes Scripture? Um, I think the main instance is the Catholic version versus the Protestant version. Of the Catholic version has several other books that are not included in the Protestant. And then um, how the Bible was formed was you know, like the, the summit of the leaders that put together all these Scriptures yeah. and said, this is the Bible. But then later on, it was determined that, no, that is not what's in the scripture. Because at least in the culture that I grew up in, is that I was told that the everything that's in the Bible should be in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that is like, that's missing. Everything right. is there, and there's nothing that's missing. Um, and that was like one of the issues that I had. I didn't necessarily about like what in scripture, but about scripture as a whole, like what is scripture. Yeah. And also, I know like the whole circular reasoning thing but then also like I know there was instances of like Paul whenever he called the works of Luke as scripture but then other than that there's no other really works of like Jesus of saying this is New Testament scripture mm. so I actually have if, if you'll email me I have a whole other talk that I've given on the canon if y'all aren't familiar with this word this is um, C-A-N-O-N which means the rule it's effectively the table of contents like, where did the table of contents of the Bible come from? Where did this list... Um, Andrew, are all the backup slides I put in, are they... Yeah, they're there. They exist? Okay, well, hold on. I may have something here. Da, 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 da. I know this is thrilling for me to do this in front of everybody. Da, da, da. I did have some backup slides. Da, 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 da. I don't have anything on the canon. All right, well, whatever. I think I put all the stuff about the... Uh, the autographer. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll quickly answer your question in recognizing that there are both Catholics and Protestants in the room. Um, that's a, there's a lot of debate on that particular topic. I think it's instructive for me to at least tell you this. You'll know in the, uh, in the college basketball tournament, they always say, like, who are the last four in and who are the first four out? You all know what I'm talking about? So let's think about that. What were, the, what were the books that, like, barely made the cut, so to speak, or the last four to make the cut when they were putting the canon together in the second and third century? It's mostly short stuff like Third John and Jude. Revelation's weird. Hebrews, we're not really sure who wrote it. Those are the ones that are like, that's for the New Testament. The Old Testament canon was fairly well established by Jesus' time. Um, and then you say, well, what are, the f what are the next four out? What are those books that people really held in high regard, but they didn't include a scripture? It's not this weird stuff like Gospel of Thomas. It's stuff that's second generation, like First Clement. And Clement himself says, like, I'm not an apostle. 
I'm not like Peter or Paul to tell you what to do. It's that gener- their books from that generation that came after the apostles. So when people put the, the canon together in the second and thir- the third century, they really did have legitimate reasons for saying, these are the books that we have treated as the apostles' teaching on what, on, on what Jesus came here to tell us. And they really did have a procedure. And what's really interesting is that there were two different groups two different groups. There's the main part of the empire, and then there was the Assyrian church of the east that was kind of disconnected from everyone else. And they went through effectively the same controversy, which is to answer the heretics like Marcion and Montanus, what's the list of, what's the list of books that belong in the New Testament? And these two groups that were physically separated from each other came up with the same list. It's remarkable. So anyway, the short answer to your question is, I think you can historically look at the way the canon was put together and say like, oh, I, think, I see why they did it. I think they got it right. Um, so that's the answer for me. I know uh, uh, from a Catholic perspective, they talk about the teaching authority of the church and that it's Bible, you know, the, 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 the Bible's authority, you know, is connected to the teaching authority of the church, etc. Um, that's a, a debate for another day, probably. Um, and I, I will say that an original canon debate is quite distinct from the question of the Apocrypha, uh, which effectively fits, mostly fits in that, um, that section between the Old Testament and the New Testament, with a few exceptions where there's like a longer ending of Daniel and Esther, that sort of thing. So, yeah. So we're actually- Five minutes over. So okay. Unfortunately, that have to be the last question. Okay. But sorry. Thanks for coming, everybody. We're yeah. going to convene over at Revs until 11. They will kick us out at 11, not at midnight anymore. So it's 11. What? So, what? Why? I know. Yeah, it's terrible. So, Sam will lead the exodus there, but we'll stick around here for a few minutes. If uh, I think Dr. Green will stay around if you have a few questions, but uh, if not, we'll hang out at Revs until 11. So, thank you all for uh, coming, and let's thank Dr. Green again.